Welcome to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Matthew Wall, who is head of MR applications at Invicro, a company that explores ways to advance personalized medicine. His work is based at Hammersmith Hospital just outside of London. Matthew received his PhD in 2003 in cognitive and brain scientists at the University of Cambridge, and until 2006, performed a postdoc at Royal Holloway. He joined the company GlaxoSmithKline in 2009, which then became Imanova in 2012, and then more recently in Vicro. Dr. Wall is a medical imaging specialist, working on both methods and applications, and mostly using fMRI. His initial training was in experimental psychology, but he's since studied vision, pain, fMRI methodologies, resting state fMRI, cognitive neuroscience, and psychopharmacology. Recently, he's been involved in research on psychedelics, cannabis, sex hormones, depression, weight loss, neurodegenerative disorders, and sexual function. His current role at Invicro allows him the opportunity to be involved in a number of clinical and non-clinical research projects, from commercial early phase one clinical trials to pure academic work. Today, we have a broad ranging conversation about the challenges of fMRI in generating biomarkers and how the central challenge is shaping up to be more fully characterizing and understanding the many dimensions of human variability. We also get into a great discussion on psilocybin and his brain imaging work towards understanding how it alleviates depression. We then talk about cannabis, as well as his more recent work on understanding the neural correlates of various treatments to reduce hypoactive sexual desire disorder. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Okay, uh, Matthew Wall, welcome. Thank you. Looking forward to this discussion because uh, you know when I was looking at your your CV and your background, it's uh, it's very eclectic and, and varied. I mean, you you started out in, uh, after you got your PhD in 2003 at, at University of Cambridge, you started out in experimental psychology, but then you moved to brain imaging and functional MRI. And then you kind of got into the, you know, sort of the technical development of fMRI a little bit and the processing, but then you went from academics to industry, and then you took on uh, the really challenging area of studying drug effects uh, mm-hmm. with fMRI. And, and we'll get into that a little bit uh, uh, in the middle of the discussion, but, but let's just start um, a little bit looking at your background. So, you know, when, when did you first realize you were interested in the brain and, and also then interested in, in brain imaging? Well, so, I mean, you're right. My career has been pretty weird, um, <clears throat> pretty varied. So I was doing my PhD in Cambridge and I started in 99 then went up to 2003. And um, it, my PhD was nothing really to do with the brain. It was kind of pretty straightforward cognitive psychology. But, uh, you know, around that time was a very, you know, important period for fMRI and people at people at, um, <clears throat> at UCL like Ray Dolan and people like that were putting out these, you know, these incredible kind of groundbreaking results, you know, getting these nailing down event related designs and things like that for the first time. And um, you know, it was a, a a real exciting time. So at, at that point, as I was finishing my PhD, I was really thinking, well, you know, this is this is a really exciting area to be in. It's fascinating. I, I want to get involved in that. So I, as for my postdoc jobs, I, I pretty much applied for whatever fMRI jobs I could I could find, and I was lucky. Even though I had really no experience, uh, I was lucky enough. To get one because actually nobody else had that much experience at the time either to be honest uh so i was lucky enough to get a job um uh with a professor called andy smith at royal holloway which is just outside london and so yeah andy andy's thing was um kind of pretty pretty low level kind of visual physiology stuff visual psychophysics looking at particularly at visual motion um, so I spent about six years working with Andy at Royal Holloway, and basically that was a, just a fantastic introduction to to fMRI. 
with that kind of uh, kind of teasing apart different bits of the visual cortex, you know, you use a lot of different methods. You use things like retinotopic mapping and, um, you know, quite precise ROI methods. So it was a, it was just a really good training from Andy and from the other people that we work with in a lot of different ways of doing um, fMRI, you know, resting state and task and and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I, I kind of have that that postdoc job to thank, really, for, for getting me into fMRI. After that, I that was six years there. And then I did, I got another postdoc job at uh, UCL, which was uh, working on a pain project, hmm. um, which, which didn't really work out very well. But at the same time, uh, this was a joint UCL project that was part funded by a big pharma company, GlaxoSmithKline. Yep. And at the time, they just set up, GSK had just set up this big imaging lab in West London. So I was doing all my uh, MRI work there. And shortly after that, GSK decided to sell that lab and it became uh, a company called Imanova. And then a few years after that, the Imanova company got bought out by an American company called Invicro, which is ah. what, what it is now. So it's kind of a weird, complicated history. So, <laughs> but, but basically, ever since about 2009, I've been working in the same place, but it's it's transitioned three times to three different names. Um, but it's the same lab in, in West London at uh, Hammersmith Hospital, which is actually where Carl Friston developed the first ideas about SPMs at the, the MRC. Uh, ah pet unit there just uh, across the road from where I work now oh. um it's a lot of, lot of good history there yeah so uh, at the end of my UCL postdoc I I got a job at this company in the same lab where I'd been working anyway and I've, I've been there ever since and um the main uh, uh focus of of this company is kind of contract research work for the pharma industry and biotech uh, industry uh, so we have we have MRI and we also have PET facilities there, and they do a lot of PET work for the pharma industry. But we're also very close to an Imperial College campus as well. So you know historically we've always done a lot of uh, work with Imperial College and some of you know some of the other universities in London and around the UK as well. I've I've been able to very nicely actually um, kind of straddle the industry academic divide so i've been i've been you know i'm not technically a proper academic i haven't been for some time but i end up doing a, quite a lot of academic work um and publishing papers and and you know going to conferences and that kind of thing and i work collaborate with a lot of, of academics at imperial and ucl and other places so it's been it's been a nice uh, halfway house between those two things for me Okay. Yeah. I was actually going to ask about uh, the, the changing of the names, but, um, and so you have like, I, so I imagine you, you have your own scanner there and uh, you also have a pet scanner there as well. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it does seem that there's a number of industry sort of, you know, that are doing sort of contract work to sort of test drug effects or things like that. And so the idea there is that, is that they try to look at the neural correlates. I mean, I guess with pets, it, it you know, it seems like it's more conceptually direct because they have, you know, ligands that, you know, they look at binding and things like that. And they actually can see the drug effects here. It's more looking at the, the brain activation response, uh, you know, if it's somehow um, further explanatory that uh, of, you know, correlates with the behavior effects or somehow informs, I guess, further uh, the drug effect in some way. I mean, I guess, is that the goal as, as, as far as that's concerned? Or Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're right in that the, the, the pet side is, is what the pharma companies generally tend to want. Yeah. Um, you know, it can be really simple questions like, you know, I have this new drug. Does it actually get into the brain? Does it penetrate the blood brain barrier? Okay. okay. So you, you radio label the drug you put it into humans, and if you see a you know a signal, a radioactive signal in the brain, then you know your drug has crossed the blood-brain barrier. And there, you know, you can do that in rats or monkeys or whatever. But there are some species differences in that kind of thing. So, you know, ideally, you want to do it in humans with PET. 
And obviously, that's a really critical uh, kind of decision point for a drug development program. If you if you have a, a candidate drug that you think is is brain active, but it doesn't actually get into the brain, well, okay, great, kill that kill that uh, program now. <laughs> go and do something else. The the, the kind of the, the the pitch that we often give to drug companies is we will kill your drug development program faster <laughs> than, faster than anybody else. <laughs> Which I guess is a good thing if they want to, you know, move on to something else quickly. Well, but you want to kill it as early as possible. You don't right. want to kill it at the end of a phase three trial when you've already spent half a billion dollars in five years. So, yeah, I mean, the pharma industry uh, kind of relies on PET quite a lot for that kind of thing. Yes. And then with the the MRI side of things, you get you get complementary information, you know. So PET, PET gives you the, the, the kind of molecular level information. And how I like to think about the fMRI work that we do is that that gives you the kind of the bridge to a, the more kind of functional tissue level systems level responses, yeah. uh, which is the kind of missing link between maybe the molecular level and the, the kind of clinical response, if you like. So with, you know, with the two techniques combined, you kind of get to see that whole conceptual pathway from the you know the drug interacting with the receptor causing some um neural effects um which have a you know kind of systems level effects and then that gives you the clinical response yeah and it seems like there's a whole i mean it's it's a hard thing because uh there's a whole art to right i mean you look at the direct drug effects i mean with fMRI at least you look at you know maybe you'll see uh, areas with dopamine receptors showing increased activation, but you might also see a modulatory effect, you know, with resting state or connectivity mm. uh, in the brain. And then, and then you might see, you might introduce a task, I imagine, or, or something like that, where then you're looking at further uh, the modulatory effect of the task. And so it's, I imagine it's being developed and, and still not a cookbook sort of thing. It's oh like, no, sure. I mean, it's it's always difficult interpreting these things, right? Uh, you know, as with with all fMRI, you know, what does this, what does a different task response on this drug actually mean? You know, or a different pattern of resting state connectivity, or yeah, it's the, you know, the PET. It, it's it's kind of a it gives you the MRI in these things gives you some some extra information, some kind of more maybe more mechanistic more physiological type information, which is, you know, uh, of scientific interest for sure. Maybe not something that you, you know, if you're a drug developer, maybe not something that you'd include in your uh, submission to the FDA to get a new drug licensed, you know, right. that, but, uh, but it, it, it certainly gives you something extra. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it might give you something that, right. Is, is, is more salient to the behavior in some sense, possibly. Mm. Um, uh, and we'll we'll get into talking about that in a second too. But um, yeah, so I actually just wanted to start uh, also just to continue on this this thread of of just talking about fMRI. You know, I, I was you know when I was looking at your CV and, and actually I just did a you know quick search and I saw a nice uh, video a talk that you gave on YouTube. Um, I guess with the Riot Science Club. Yeah. And, and towards the end, it was actually hit upon something that is kind of a big thing in the field right now in some sense uh, uh, with the recent Merrick paper saying you need a thousand, 2000 subjects for, for looking mm -hmm. at an effect because it's a correlation values of you know, 0.1. Um, you were actually part of this, uh, this paper of variability analysis of, of single neural imaging data set by many teams. And, and also you, uh, you mentioned uh, Hariri's group. Uh, you know, they had a, a paper that sort of, said, you know, the ICC values are 0.4. And so fMRI is incredibly variable. And it was actually interesting. You, But then you, you talked about, and they talked about in the paper, this this classic paper by Cronbach, an American psychologist in 1957, that he kind of brought out these, you know, the, and, and, and usually like the popular press picks up on this and they say, well, you know, fMRI is not sensitive. It's a problem with fMRI. But, but I think that the insight that, that you conveyed is that it's not necessarily a sensitivity problem with fMRI. It's more that you know we're realizing that that people uh, are very variable. I mean, not only a single person from task to task, but also across people, they vary in many different dimensions, and it's really hard to 
make sense of that. And so there's two, you know, you, you laid it out nicely. It's, uh, you know, there, there's the experimental discipline, which is to try to un uncover universals about people. And, the, you know, the approach is to average them all together and see what you see or else whatever. But there's another one, correlational discipline, which is sort of like looking at actually studying the difference, the differences over time, the difference with each subject, the difference across people, because it's so multidimensional. And uh, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit more, talk a little bit on that topic, because I think it's it's sort of the point is, is that I think that there's so much variability because... Uh, we don't yet understand the variability of people as opposed to just fMRI as a messy technique. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's 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 really hard getting a handle on this stuff. But, you know, in some ways, fMRI is, is incredibly reliable. You know, you can put anybody in a scanner yep. and show them a visual stimulus and you will see, you know, reliable activation in the visual cortex or get them to do finger tapping or, you know, something simple like that. Yeah. You know, you will see that all day, every day, anybody. But then you get people to, you know, do something a little bit more complex, do some kind of cognitive task, and you end up with these very kind of unreliable um, metrics or, you know, uh, like ICCs and things like that. I, and you're right. The problem, like many things in this world, the problem is people. Um, <laughs> and there's a there's a quote, I think, I don't know where it comes from. I think it, I heard Sophie Scott say it, but I don't know if it's hers. Uh, humans are very dirty test tubes, <laughs> um, which is that, yeah, you know, People just don't perform consistently across across sessions, and then there's, there's big variability between different subjects as well. And and this is a real problem uh, for the development of, say, you know, biomarkers. You know, people have been talking about imaging biomarkers for you know twenty years, and nobody's really found any. I mean, the closest I guess we've got is the kind of the amyloid beta and tau proteins build up in, in you know pet studies of Alzheimer's and things like that. Yeah. Which is useful as an index of, you know, cognitive decline and things, but but again, still not you know, not perfect. You know, any any kind of imaging derived measure is 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 not as clear as the kind of standard biomarkers that we have, you know, for blood borne proteins in cancer or, or you know, things like that. You know, right. You, you do a blood test if you have certain proteins in your blood, your doctor will know that you have a particular kind of cancer. Yeah. It's, very, you know, it's completely diagnostic. It's very clear. There's, there's nothing that we've found anyway so far based on imaging measures that kind, kind of comes close to that level of, yeah. of specificity. You're hitting on all these, mm. these good points. And, that, and I think actually, right. I mean, I think that, that uh, um, you know, people find effects. I mean, and I think that's the thing. I think that, you know, when, if you're trying to find a biomarker, one, you know, a, a group might say, well, you need, you know, thousands of subjects and you get some sort of small effect. Mm. And I always wonder, you know, if you get this tiny effect uh, after 2000 subjects, is that really going to be a biomarker? If you actually are trying to put one subject in the scanner and saying, oh, does your pattern of activity or connectivity look like this? I mean, it seems like you're, you're, up against that problem yeah so that's, 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 yeah that's the key challenge it's moving from these yeah you can you can get a bunch of and a bunch of healthy controls and and look for differences and you you know you can find some sure um but but it's yeah it's moving from that group level to uh, something that's going to be useful either diagnostically or you know some kind of index of treatment response or something yeah. Um, at an individual level, that's the, the the real challenge. And that's something that we're still really struggling with. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like an ongoing struggle. It might be, you know, I mean, there's many different types of clinical applications of fMRI. I mean, you can look at longitudinally, like one subject where you have an intervention, you look at a change. That seems like it has more promise in some, some regards. Uh, but, um, you know, right, there's all kinds of things like even looking at depression and, mm -hmm. and also maybe using fMRI as a method for identifying areas that you can then do neuromodulation, you know, TMS or whatever mm -hmm. in these yeah. nodes to try to modulate things. That seems hopeful. And maybe biomarkers, maybe if we're, and also I also often think that, you know, how we, you know, average subjects together, how we uh, 
uh, it seems like there's so much variability, even in, you know, you parcelate and then you average, uh, that already seems like it smears everything. And then, mm. um, but, but yeah, and I think we'll get better at that. And also we might get better at looking at, you know, right now the features are, uh, you know, connectivity, resting state connectivity and activation. Mm. Um, but there might be other features uh, mm. in the signal that might be more informative and more reliable. Yeah, but I mean, it comes back to what you said about that distinction between the two types of psychology that Cronbach said. So we've been very heavily focused on the experimental side at the moment. Uh, but I think trying to understand, trying to examine and understand the variability from the from the other perspective might be a good way to go in future. If yeah. we can, if we can, if we can understand the sources of variability, maybe we can then account for them. Yeah, um, and and try and get closer to where we want to be. Yep, uh, and that's where I think the field is at right now. We're just mm -hmm. starting to realize. Wait a second, there's more variability in within. We realize. Let's get our heads around this. Let's understand this variability. Mm -hmm. And I think also, you know, I think that paper that you mentioned with Hariri, you know, they mentioned, you know, developing tasks. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, Emily Finn, for instance, I just happened to think of her because she's mm -hmm. sort of trying to develop these naturalistic stimuli that are kind of like, in a sense, like a litmus test to sort of pull out differences more, um, as opposed to just something that you're trying to find something modulated, but maybe there's not much room for modulation. I, I, I really like that that approach, yeah, that, that Emily's using. And I, I think that the, the naturalistic stimulus thing has a, has a lot of um, potential because it's not you know, there's most of the most of the work that's been done on it has been fairly methodological, if you like, with you know healthy healthy subjects. It's not been used very much in kind of clinical studies or, or drug studies. I'm, I'm starting to kind of explore that in some of some of my recent work, which maybe we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. But yeah, I think that has a lot of potential just because it's it's a bit more constrained than you know your typical resting state study. So you know. Resting state is, you know, incredibly useful in lots of ways, but it's almost a, a, a the worst case for for variability because you know you know it's completely un unconstrained. You're not telling the subject your subjects to do anything. Yeah, they could be thinking yeah. about anything. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, with a, with a, a naturalistic stimulus, a movie, or even a piece of music or something like that, you are giving people something to focus on. You are constraining their their cognitions in in some way, at least. Anyway, um, but you still get the get the are able to do that kind of resting state connectivity type um, analyses with it and get those get those metrics out. Yeah, yeah. So I think that will develop mm. a lot in the future. Yeah. Okay. So now that we've sort of laid that groundwork, I mean, it's sort of a Depressing in some sense, not really depressing, but it's it's, it's a challenge. There's yeah, a lot of work to be done. But it, I'm I'm op, I'm very optimistic as far as that's concerned. I think that fMRI is this amazing tool that we just have to then you know we're realizing you know like it, anything in science we're realizing that it's the challenge is is bigger than we first imagined it would be. Mm. But I think there's instant that that could be gained. But so let's get into uh, your really cool work on uh, you know drug effects, looking at psilocybin, cannabis, and mm. also looking at effects that uh, affects sexual desire. Uh, so let's start with psilocybin. Okay. It's, it, it seems that has been a lot of recent interest in it uh, just because it's being studied a little bit more. Uh, you know, after the 60s, it was sort of shut down and every, nobody was allowed to even touch it. And now we're realizing there's potential real therapeutic effects. And, and you've been sort of, you had a couple of studies here now. So looking yeah. at those effects. So, so let's just begin. Why, why don't you lay out what's the what's the idea now that uh, what how does psilocybin work? So well, I mean, there's there's two really I mean interesting aspects to how psilocybin works. So what you know what most people think about when they talk about psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin are the acute effects, which are hallucinations and you know tripping, right? Um, and that's what you know recreational users use them for. You know, which you know, can be a lot of fun, and you know, so on. Um, but then there are another class of effects, really, which are more clinically relevant, more useful, perhaps, which persist. So the you know the acute effects last for 
five, six, seven hours, maybe with psilocybin, a bit longer with LSD. But then what you find, what the people found back in the 50s and 60s when they were doing this stuff, was that there are effects that persist for days, weeks, months, you know, possibly even longer, which are clinically useful. Uh, so a lot of the, the the kind of recent work has been, I mean, looking at these two kinds of very different effects and trying to figure out how one relates to the other. So, you know, about 10 years, of, 10 years ago, I was lucky enough to start working with a group at Imperial led by uh, David Nutt and uh, Robin Carhart-Harris. Uh, and I first worked with them on a study with MDMA, actually. Uh, and then, they, then they've then they done two clinical trials with psilocybin with uh, depressed patients. Um, and they've done some, some MRI, um, fMRI on both of those trials. And what they found is that uh, psilocybin really has incredibly potent antidepressant effects mm-hmm. almost immediately. So in, in the first in the first study, we we used treatment resistant depression patients. Okay. So these are people who um, have tried a number of different drug treatments previously, SSRIs or even the kind of the older style uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, various kinds of talking therapy nothing has worked for them some of these patients had been depressed for you know 20 years they put them through this course of of psychedelic psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and we scanned them before and after now so i'm i'm not you know any kind of clinician or anything i I wasn't involved in the the clinical therapy side of the study but i did see them before and after because we scanned them at baseline and we scanned them you know the day after the therapy and uh i i I strongly remember for at least a few of these patients, just the the different impressions that they gave, you know, know, a week apart. Uh, Some of them, you know, looked like different people when they came back after the the therapy, they were, you know, lively and engaged and, and, and happy, you know, which which they very much hadn't been on the, on the, the baseline session. So, how what do we think is happening here so psilocybin uh has its you know main action at uh, the 5-ht2a receptor which is a, a receptor which is expressed quite widely over the cortex not so much not so much in the the subcortex more, more cortical so you know there there've been pet studies where they've they've looked at the receptor binding and and um uh related the level of receptor binding to the kind of subjective effects that people have. So we know that the, you know, the level of binding that you get, the 5-HT2A receptor is kind of closely related to the, the acute hallucinogenic effects. Okay. And so what, what's actually going on? So as far as the hallucinogenic effects, is it, is it mm-hmm. somehow, I mean, it's somehow uh, disrupting, uh, you know, uh, what, I mean, it, what do you think it's it's actually? I mean, what does this receptor do, and and, well, and kind of what is it? So a big a big question is again like coming back to something we mentioned previously, kind of bridging that gap between the molecular level and the functional level. Yeah. So what seems to happen on a kind of network level when you when you're you know having a, a trip, if you like, is this very kind of unconstrained pattern of brain activity. Uh, so the early studies uh, was quite, you know, the results were quite surprising in that they showed actually, you know, you, you, you might imagine that things are firing off more strongly than normal or, or but actually what, what it appeared to be was that there was, there was a suppression of the normal uh, pattern of, of brain function yeah. and connectivity in the early studies. And we later realized us and various other groups around the world have kind of come up with similar kind of results that it's uh it's that that reduction is is really a epiphenomenon of a, a of a, a complete almost a complete breakdown in the normal kind of structure and hierarchy yeah. so you find that 
areas that are normally talking to each other a lot, like the standard resting state networks, the default mode network and things like that. Yes. Nodes within the default mode network uh, are, are not talking to each other as much as they normally do. And there's much more connectivity between networks. So it's it's a, almost like a kind of randomization of, of the, the normal patterns of brain connectivity. Yeah. So normal network function breaks down and you get these areas all talking to, to other areas that they don't normally talk to. We think that's what produces the, the, the kind of subjective effects that you get with these drugs. Okay. And so you kind of get a, uh, I mean, in some sense you get a, right, sort of a resetting of, you know, sort of like, a, it kind of like wipes the slate in some sense. And, and the brain is sort of like, it almost, I would say maybe a random state. And maybe, maybe that's why, I mean, I've also read that like, you know, right, the set and setting before the treatment is important. I mean, to sort of prepare the brain. And, and so it's not totally random, it's sort of, you know, you have an intent uh, of something as opposed to just allowing it to be totally random. This is all, this is all kind of theorizing really still at this point. Yeah. But yes. The, what, you know, what we think is that, as you say, it kind of wipes the slate clean. Um, and, and that, and that gives you a, a window of opportunity where you can you can rebuild the connections in the way that you want to yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. through through the therapy um, through the therapy sessions that happen kind of the day after we always have, people always have what they call integration sessions the day after and it's it's um, it's almost like putting the brain back into a kind of uh, flexible plastic state yeah where you can get out of the ruts that you that you may have, have have got into with your depression or you know various other kinds of any other kind of disorder which is characterized by kind of rigid and inflexible behaviors obsessive compulsive disorder eating disorders yeah. uh, chronic pain you know people yeah. are looking at all these kinds of things now with with psychedelic therapy uh, so you're putting the putting the brain back into this this flexible plastic state that you can then influence through the particular kind of therapy that you that you that you go through and kind of degrade the the previous bad uh rigid yeah of behavior and develop develop perhaps healthier new ones yeah so it seems like it's almost like I mean in the in the past they had uh, well, I guess they still might have a little bit uh, electroconvulsive therapy I mean it's kind of like you know you imagine that sort of thing did something similar much more you know bluntly yeah. <laughs> and non pharmacologically but uh, but sort of maybe the same idea um, yes exactly so there's there's a lot of um, commonalities between those yeah those yeah. two things yeah I think the psilocybin is more pleasant yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, a lot of patients do have a fairly challenging time with it of course yeah yeah i mean right you can have uh so right do they get the same therapeutic effects let's say if they have like a a bad trip in some sense where that's like horrible and it's a nightmare wow well, yeah um, this is a really good question so there's there's a lot of work looking at particular features of the uh, of the experience and trying to relate that to, to kind of later clinical effects um, you know, some people have a very kind of uh, spiritual, mystical type experience with these things. And a, a lot of people think that that's, that's a really important feature and that, that drives later clinical effects. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's where it gets a little bit uh, right into the realm of sort of like an art of, you know, trying to figure out. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, who knows? I mean, there could be some aspect of cognitive control that sort of helps guide things a little bit in, in, in that regard. But, but, but let me, let me actually just uh, talk about your, the results of your paper. So mm -hmm. your paper, so you had a paper, uh, um, uh, first author was Robin uh, Erhard Harris in mm -hmm. scientific reports in 2017 uh, and uh, on treat, psilocybin treatment resistant depression. And you showed that, um, you know, that there was a decrease in CBF uh, in the temporal cortex, an increase in default mode network connectivity, uh, I guess an increase in ventral medial prefrontal cortex, bilateral, inferior lateral parietal cortex connectivity. It's, and that was predictive of the response. So the yeah. sort of the increased, yeah, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, bilateral 
uh, inferior lateral parietal cortex connectivity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also decreased parahippocampal prefrontal cortex connectivity. So, uh, how do you make sense of those results? Uh, you know, it's sort of like you're sort of building a, I guess, seeing the effects uh, and and sort of building the model of what might be happening in that regard. Yeah. So I. What, you know what I think is happening here. So this this paper was was from the first clinical trial, and it's, it's patients scanned um, a baseline, and then the day after their their therapy session. So so what we're seeing here is you know they're no longer high, they're no longer hallucinating. What we're seeing here is the the hangover, if you like. Yep. Now with psilocybin, you actually get the opposite of a hangover. You get what people sometimes call the afterglow, uh, which is you actually feel better the next day yeah. <laughs> than you normally do. Uh, so so that's, the, that's kind of what we're trying to capture here. So, you know, I guess what, what all these results relate to really is, is that carryover of that, that really kind of acute disintegration of the brain's normal way of functioning. Uh, so all of these kind of connectivity results uh, are really, I think, kind of the, the the peaks in that in that kind of overall, more general process, if you like. Okay. And what we tried to do in that paper was was you know find these connectivity effects and then try and relate them to longer term, you know, clinical clinical effects. Yeah. Uh, and we found a couple that that, that relate, but um, I think. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, completely convinced about, you know, we've picked these, these particular seed regions and we found particular brain regions that, that you, you know, are different. I'm not sure there's a huge amount of utility in interpreting that. Okay. Well, right. you know, the inferior frontal gyrus is different here. That must mean something important. I think it's these yeah. are kind of, uh, a, a kind of broad underlying effect. And we're looking at the, the, the little bits that stick up above the, the, the parapet, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's interesting. So it, at least it's sort of like, right, the peaks of the iceberg or the, the tips yeah. of the iceberg in terms of what, I mean, there, obviously there's some brain wide changes and, um, and right. I mean, it, it, it would be interesting to see how long these sort of things persist. Like you, for instance, you know, you have the increased connectivity, the default mm -hmm. mode network and, you know, other things like that, how long, you know, if there's an acute effect and, and, and how long these persist. And, and if the people actually go back to, you know, if they go back to their previous state, is that going back to their rut or they somehow, I also wonder if their brain changes in some, you know, you know, they're, right, their depression might change, but could other things change? Like, um, you know, if they learn specific skills or, <laughs> or if they, you know, it seems that, uh, it seems like depression might be a light rut that is easily gotten out of, whereas learning skills or learning, you know, other things like that might be, uh, obviously harder yeah. to get out of. Now. There is, I mean, there is some evidence actually quite recently, there was a, there was a, oh, I can't remember the authors, but there was a, there was a rat paper, which, which claimed that, that, that um, psilocybin can reopen critical periods of neuroplasticity and rats mm. for learning mazes and, and things like that. So, you know, critical periods are like, it's, it's much easier to, easier to learn a language when you're, when you're a kid. Yeah. You know, as you get older, these things, you know, ossify a bit and, and it, uh, learning anything new gets harder. I certainly find that anyway. So uh, they claimed in this paper anyway that, that, that um, psilocybin can reopen those critical periods, at least to an extent. And there was quite a focus on looking at the effects of psychedelics on neuroplasticity generally. So there's a couple of studies where they've looked at uh, blood markers of neuroplasticity, like brain-derived neurotrophic factor (BDNF), yep. and found increased levels uh, after after psilocybin. You know, one of the things I, I'd love to do is some PET work. Uh, there's some there's some really good recent PET ligands which are um, looking at um, synaptic vesicle two A protein, which is a, a protein kind of expressed in every synapse. So it's 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 a pretty good marker of synaptic density. So, yeah, one of the things I'd love to do, and I think some other people are working on it, is looking at, at those kind of molecular markers of neuroplasticity and, and, and psychedelics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. 
And, the, and, right. Imagine, yeah, I mean, I, you, you also hear about people trying to do microdosing of uh, psilocybin, I guess it sort of, in some level might increase the, you know, it's, it's a tiny level, increase the, you know, the plasticity and maybe, you know, they say it. Increases. Yeah, the microdosing thing is, is, is kind of weird. I don't, I don't really know what to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because it, it like it shouldn't work really. Like everything we know about how drugs work, it shouldn't really work. Right. Um, and there's a there's only a couple of kind of placebo controlled studies that that, that really show that it doesn't really do anything yeah. much beyond placebo. But then uh, so many people are really keen on it, and, and yeah, they have, you know. Well, if there is a continuous effect, I mean, there you know you can imagine maybe. Who knows? I mean, right. I mean, is, is it a stepwise sort of thing or is it continuous? Who knows? It's, you know, uh, these are uniquely powerful drugs. You know, these are yeah. the most powerful drugs in t terms of altering consciousness that we know of. So, yeah, I mean, I, I could conceivably think that, that with regular small doses, you might get some kind of upregulation, downregulation, uh, synaptic effects or, or something. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, we have a... Uh, uh, Dr. Zarati here at the NIH. I, I'm at the NIH mm. uh, uh, studying like uh, ketamine, you know, it's sort of similar, yeah, but yeah. different in some ways, maybe more acute. Uh, uh, but yeah, there's, it's, it's interesting, the whole concept of, of, of resetting, uh, uh, getting out of your rots uh, in yeah. that regard. And you have this other paper too, that uh, talks about, uh, you know, just as an evidence, which was, I thought really was nice is evidence for this effect sort of in the brain is sort of the increased amygdala response to emotional faces. So when you're depressed, you know, you kind of see an emotional face, you don't get a response and it's behaviorally, but you know, you see less amygdala, but here, you know, it's sort of like a, a nice measure in, in brain imaging of mm -hmm. the, the, the effectiveness because after the, after the treatment, people have are more, their amygdala is more responsive to the emotional faces, which shows mm -hmm. they're more reactive. They're more, open in that regard so yeah yeah so that was that was from the same trial um and we've I've actually got some new data which are, which I'm, I'm still finishing the write-up on which is um comparing uh psilocybin therapy with a, a standard uh ssri therapy like normal first line depression treatment uh drug called escitalopram and what you find there is a big difference in the the emotional uh, reactivity after both sets of therapy. So you get this this big reduction in uh, responses in in this the SSRI group. Um, so one of the, one of the common side effects that you get with SSRIs is what people call emotional blunting, hmm. um, where people f generally feel less emotionally responsive. You know, they don't cry. At, movies like they used to or they enjoy listening to music or things like that yeah um so in this trial we we you know we got you know really good uh antidepressant effects of this both both treatments actually but then you get this big drop in emotional responsiveness with the ssri and you don't see that in psilocybin which is nice. So you get you're getting this antidepressant effect, but without this, you know, the the, the SSRI seems to just turn down everything. Yeah, it yeah. Puts a blanket over the the depression, but also maybe the positive things as well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. So this sort of yeah, it's a completely different mechanism, but uh, yeah. yeah, interesting. So before we get on to other things. Um, the last paper, just uh, w once again, it was very recent in Nature Medicine. First author, Richard Dawes, that you were on as well, is that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, once again, as we were saying, it's a, sort of a, you, you notice an, a decreased brain network modularity. And and that's actually kind of an interesting uh, metric in some sense, looking at the, you know, you, people divide the brain into nodes and they see how connected they are. And they actually, uh, and it's, it seems like it's very sensitive because you're, looking at the whole brain and you're looking at at these connectivity matrices and uh um and it seems that right there's increased network integration and the 5 hd 2 a receptor rich regions become more interconnected and flexible so it's just as it's, the model seems like it's taking shape in that regard and um do you think so just a more of a methodological question mm. um in terms of 
uh, determining, I mean, it seems like determining modularity is a really sensitive measure. Do you think that how it's done, uh, you know, just simply trying to look at connectivity between regions is, is the best way or else maybe, you know, having a more open approach of trying to determine, you know, uh, using some sort of, you know, uh, ICA or some sort of uh, method just to say, oh, well, you know, how many modules uh, exist in the first place? Or is there less modules or more modules? You know, in our, we have this work where we're doing multi-echo ICA and we're actually mm. sort of in an unbiased way trying to figure out how many nodes there are uh, just by looking at, uh, you know, after we do ICA, we look at the bold dependence and it seems that there's more ICA components that are bold like, uh, in younger kids than in, in, in older people, there's, it seems like mm. there's a more increased. So there's changing in the number of modules, which is mm. in some ways, the same way of saying as the, the modules are more connected in some sense. Mm. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the, the paper you mentioned, that was, you know, brilliant work by Richard Dawes and yeah, I, the, you know, the modularity measure, it's, it's, it's useful, I think. It's also kind of crude as well in that you know, you're deriving a single measure from the entire brain. It's not, yeah. there's no spatial specificity there. You're not saying anything about which particular regions are doing what. So, yeah, it's 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 perhaps a useful measure. And, it, you know, we've shown that it's maybe sensitive um, to clinical effects or correlated with, with, with clinical effects, which is great. But, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's something that, we need to dig into more, I think, and and start maybe saying things about particular brain systems or um, yeah getting getting a bit more specific about just saying well the whole brain is more modular or less yeah. modular sorry yeah yeah um, it's once again it's sort of like at the edge of like you know the art and science of of doing fMRI it's sort of like you're you're both trying to figure out what the features are but trying to use them as well and trying to build a model and so it's it's hard. I mean, it's we're in an early sort of rich yeah. stage. <laughs> Plus, you know, all of these studies, they're all pretty small as well. You know, we're talking about 20, 25, 30 subjects, if you're lucky. It's incredibly hard and incredibly expensive. And it takes an incredibly long time to do these clinical studies with you know schedule one controlled drugs it's yeah. you know, just just getting the paperwork done yeah um beforehand is um and i shouldn't moan about that because actually i don't do very much of that it's mostly the imperial team gets all that should get all the credit for that <laughs> um but still yeah you know it takes years to do these things and yeah. and i think we can start digging into this stuff a bit more once we have some you know N equals 50, N equals 100 uh, studies, then we might be able to say a bit more about these things. Before we get into the, the other topic of cannabis and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and other, other, other drugs, um, that sort of brings to mind sort of the question is, you know, back to the, the point of trying to find biomarkers or whatever, it, as hard as the, it, it would be great to figure out a way to streamline clinical trials and things like that. That's another question altogether. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, if you're trying to find it, I mean, I guess it depends on the goal of your study. If you're trying to find an effect that's universal or is it somehow just anecdotal or somehow related um, to therapy, uh, you know, is is even 100 subjects enough? I, I mean, what, you know, how, when, when can you actually have an effect that you can say, oh, this is real, use this drug in this way because of this brain effect? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure, but I mean, like you, I'm 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 optimistic, and I, I'm still up for trying these things. I'd I'd love to understand the variability, you know. So what we've seen in the, in the psilocybin depression trials is that a, roughly a third of people are cured, you know. So yeah. six months follow up, they are no longer depressed after these one or two doses of psilocybin. That's fantastic. Yeah, uh, about another third have a good response initially but then kind of drift drift back down into their depressive state over the course of a few weeks or months. And then about another third have a less of a response initially and, and the, the treatment just doesn't really work for them. So, you know, I think a real priority is trying to figure out 
that's that's we've got some you know decent groups there you know a third a third a third you know roughly speaking um and i'd love to try and figure out what what's making these people different and uh yeah. you know and that's actually a really important point because it's not just like you know when people look at the the effects it's like oh you say a third 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 and, mm. and initially people think oh it's just random you know it's like a random process third 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 Mm. whatever but no it's actually there might be something very specific about those people <laughs> that yeah. we haven't uncovered mm. yet that makes it you know much more uh powerful to, to sort of go into why yeah i mean i i hope so i hope we can figure that out but like i said we, we're not going to be able to figure that out with a, a sample size of 20 you know right. and with seven in each of these you know groups of a third we're going to need 100 150 200 yeah um, yeah something, you know. Well, hopefully we get cheaper and uh, hopefully they be driven more by the, the, you know, at least the hints of these sort of things bootstrap themselves forward a little bit. Yeah. And hopefully well, you know, more. we've now got a lot of interest in psychedelics from, from industry. You know, there's, there's about a hundred, I think, new psychedelics companies have started up in the last three years. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, when when I first started working with David and Robin about 10 years ago, it was the group at Imperial that was doing this stuff. And it was another group at Johns Hopkins led by Roland Griffiths that were looking yep. at psychedelics. And that was it yeah. in the world. And then in the last three, four years, it's, it's suddenly exploded. And there's all this uh, industry money now sloshing around. There's, there's a hundred clinical trials running with various things like, psilocybin lsd mdma um various other more exotic uh, psychedelics so it's a really exciting time yeah and hopefully we'll, we'll you know we'll people are mostly focused on the the more clinical effects at the moment not so much on the on the kind of mechanistic things yeah that, that i'm interested in with you know fmri um but but hopefully that will come yeah um, yeah and it's also interesting because as a drug itself, I mean, it's not, I mean, from what I understand, it's not that addictive. Uh, people who take it don't really feel a huge desire to take it again anytime soon. I mean, it's not like they're against it, but it's just that, you know, it's just whatever. Um, yeah, it doesn't, certainly doesn't have that kind of classical addictive uh, drive like you get with, you know, stimulants and, and yeah, other drugs right. and opiates. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, hopefully it can keep on going. So hmm. well, let's, Let's look at another drug that you've been studying, um, uh, and, and uh, cannabis. So that's becoming more popular. It seems like every every couple of years, there's more and more states, at least the United States, that have legalized it. And mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and it, what's interesting, obviously, they're interested in the THC effects as opposed to the uh, CBD effects, potentially. Uh, and you have a really nice uh, paper that sort of looks at at this differential effect, you know, there's the CBD people can buy that and it's not psychoactive. Uh, and then there's a THC effect and that, and your paper in uh, psychopharmacology in 2022 just showed that THC, the, the psychoactive effect affects the, mm. disrupts the limbic system. And that might relate to the negative effects and the psychoactive effects, whereas the CBD seems to blunt that, uh, and potentially cause, uh, maybe therapeutic effects, maybe, uh, or, or, I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, there's lots of different cannabinoid chemicals in cannabis. There's about 100, I think, that's been identified. But the, the two big ones tend to be THC and, and CBD, cannabidiol. There's, there's been this idea around for a while that they kind of work in opposition. So THC is psychoactive and um, kind of uh, psychotomimetic, uh, produces psychosis, is perhaps addictive, um, is, is anxiogenic, whereas CBD is, a, is the opposite. You know, it, it's psycholytic, it's anxiolytic, it's, it's non-addictive and may even help with, with addiction. And what's happened over the last 20 years is that the THC level in cannabis has gone through the roof. Yeah. Know, cannabis, well, say, 30 or 40 years ago, you were talking about, you know, maybe three or four percent THC. Uh, cannabis, you know, that you can 
you may buy on the street or in licensed places anyway, you can get up to like 30, 35, even 40 percent um, THC levels now. And this wow. is, yeah, I mean, which is crazy. I mean, this is this is real knock your head off stuff. Yeah. Um, and what's happened as people have bred these cannabis strains for higher and higher THC levels is that kind of as a consequence, the levels of all the other cannabinoids, including CBD, because they've been selected for high THC content, the levels of all the others have declined. So you used to get cannabis, which had a kind of balance of THC and other cannabinoids, including CBD. But now you get this very strong, very quite pure THC cannabis. And over the same period, over the last you know, 20 or 30 years, there's been a huge increase in the number of people reporting problems associated with cannabis use. So addiction, psychosis, various other things. Now, cannabis addiction just didn't really exist 30 years ago. It just wasn't a thing. You know, nobody, nobody ever sought help for an addiction to cannabis. But all of a sudden, we have large numbers of people claiming that they're addicted to cannabis and they can't stop. Uh, so something has changed, right? Something has become a problem that wasn't a problem before. Yeah. Um, so anyway, sorry, long explanation, long background. The point of uh, that study you mentioned was to try and look at the the different effects of THC and CBD on the brain, what they're doing to the resting state networks. And yeah, one of one of the um, effects that we found was that kind of pure THC uh, has kind of strong disruptions of uh, striatocortical connections, uh, particularly in the the limbic striatum, so the nucleus accumbens and the, and the head of the caudate, yep. and these are areas that are you know very associated with addiction yeah. um, and psychosis, in fact. Uh, and then, but then when you give both together, when you give THC and CBD, it seems the CBD seems to to ameliorate that effect, so you don't get that really strong acute disruption that you get with the THC. Okay. So that does that does suggest that the CBD is 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 kind of buffering the user a bit against the negative effects of of THC. Um, and also, right? I mean, uh, yeah, that obviously the, the the therapeutic. So the therapeutic effect of is is comes mostly from the CBD. Actually, I imagine uh, the anti anxiety effect and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, CBD by itself is being investigated in as a th- possible therapy in, in psychosis, mostly actually. Um, people use it for you know uh, smoking addiction as well and, and various other things. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so once again, right? This is sort of a, a study that looks at you know identifies this, these connectivity changes as a, a way to further confirm uh, the. Uh, the the differential effects of of this so that's mm. that's a really nice I mean that's a very powerful nice approach as well just very simple and, and directed and yeah. yeah yeah I mean again there's there's a kind of interpretation gap if you like so we see these these effects on resting state networks great what does that actually mean you know okay yeah. we can talk about okay the, the, the accumbens is is very involved in addiction is it is it these connectivity effects that are driving the addictive properties of THC? Well, uh, you know, you know <laughs> but, but it's a step in the right direction, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's it's potentially right. I mean, you don't know the causality mm. sometimes. I mean, if you have like you know dopamine and then connectivity changes, is it the connectivity changes or the dopamine itself? Is it somehow something very limbic? And uh, yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, and then certainly uh, it's the beginning of. You know, it's it's a measurement, and we're we're you know doing our best. To, you're doing your best to 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 make. I mean, I think that the risk. I think that the the perception sometimes in the, in the risk in the field is that you know it's uh, so much. So many studies are like are are like you know just so stories. I mean, sort of like you know you see you know salt and pepper sort of activation, and you make a story to sort of explain it, and and as opposed to what people argue is sort of like, well, very hypothesis driven and rigorous. And and the reality is, is that it's kind of always both in some regard. I mean, you, you have an hypothesis and you update it and you do your best to not fool yourself, uh, you know, in Mm -hmm. terms of, you know, having a story that just explains something that has no uh, predictive power 
uh, you want to, you know, obviously increase the predictive power and have it fit into some larger model. I mean, mm. that's what, that's what you do. I mean, that's, mm. the, <laughs> that's what we're stuck with. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 You work with what you got, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, interesting. Okay. So let's, uh, let's move on to the, the, the last part, uh, um, or the second to last part, but almost the last part, the, uh, looking at, uh, and this is interesting. This is something that I actually, I, I honestly never knew was a, was a thing is, uh, the problem of uh, hypoactive sexual desire in women and, uh, and, and, and the, the effects of, uh, so you mentioned you have two papers. One just came out just literally a few weeks ago, a few days ago. Uh, one looking at a common hormone or a common drug called kispeptin and the mm-hmm. other one looking at uh, melanocortin. Yeah. So basically the idea is that these drugs increase sexual desire. And now you're looking into the exactly what's going on in the brain as far as that's concerned. Um, could you talk a little bit about that then? What, what are your brain imaging findings? What yeah. does this mean? So first, I just want to say, I didn't, re- I never really intended to end up being the sex and drugs fMRI. <laughs> I didn't really know how it happened. You know, I started out with the best of intentions doing low level visual physiology, really, you know, worthy, but boring. Um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, it just seemed to happen. So <laughs> uh, a while ago, um, Again, this was a different bunch of uh, uh, clinicians at Imperial who are endocrinologists, and, and they they've been working with this hormone called kispeptin for a while. They've been using it to uh, as an infertility treatment, actually, for certain kinds of infertility, hmm. which is lovely. So this is a uh, uh, Professor uh, Wolgit Dillo and uh, Alex Komlinos at Imperial, and these are these are clinical endocrinologists, you know, real real doctors. Um, and there's a lovely picture on on Walgett's office wall of all the kispeptin babies that have been born as a result of this infertility wow. treatment, which is wow. yeah, which is fantastic. <laughs> That's cool. So kispeptin, I mean, peripherally, it um, it just stimulates the the reproductive hormone system. So you get these big increases in other hormones like LH and FSH and estrogen and testosterone. Um, but there's also kispeptin receptors all over the brain. So they they've been doing this infertility stuff for a while. They approached well my company and me essentially and said look we've got this thing uh we think it's active in the brain can we you know can we do something with this so a while ago we did the you know the first brain imaging study with kispeptin in healthy you know healthy men and and the papers you mentioned more recently we kind of expanded this into looking at uh well maybe we can use this as a as a clinical treatment in this syndrome called uh, hypoactive sexual desire disorder hsdd and so we've we've done a couple of studies now so we've done a study in we've done two studies in women actually one with kispeptin and one with another um kind of sexual stimulant drug called bromelanotide and we just actually last week we just got a paper accepted which is a, a similar study in men and the approach we've used in these studies is is uh, you know a placebo scan and a, a scan with the the dose of the drug active dose and and then um showing these people you know sexually explicit material in the scanner so this is one of the things i referred to when i was talking about i'm tr- i'm just starting to get into the kind of naturalistic um movie stimuli yeah so we showed them you know porn movies yeah essentially. <laughs> <laughs> So we show in these studies, I think the most interesting aspect of it is we showed them a, a single kind of continuous eight or 10 minute uh, movie and they tracked their arousal level in real time. They had a little handheld kind of dial device where they could move a pointer on a screen where, where, whenever they wanted to. Yeah. Um, so we had this nice kind of real time subjective measure of arousal. And actually, in the male study, we 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 had an object, objective measure of arousal because we attached a, a small device to the appropriate part of the men in order to measure their arousal. Um, so we had a, a more objective measure, and we then we then used those uh, measures to interrogate the the fMRI data. We used you know things derived from those arousal time series to to look at what areas of the brain were kind of correlating with. So quick question there. Um, yeah. 
I mean, other other uh, more standard, uh, you know, obviously with different levels of arousal, like, you know, for instance, our, you know, skin conductance or, or pupil dilation or things like that. Is that yeah. use it all or is that just simply considered uh, maybe flat line, you know, maybe, you know, already uh, uh, highly aroused. And so it's not there's not much variability or something. It's just, um yeah, I mean, we 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 haven't uh, thought about using that those kind of measures, but I mean, it's a good it's a good it's a good point. I don't know, I, I don't actually know if skin conductance correlates well with with sexual arousal. I'm not. Yeah, sure. I, I I don't know. I don't no, know. I don't know either. I mean, there but, could be different types of that. right to which systems are, are yeah. aroused, and yeah. I, I, I'm beginning to realize pupil dilation is incredibly sensitive to. Uh, it seems like arousal, but it might be too sensitive mm. in some sense. It's sort of like maybe, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so yeah. anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 it's fine. Again, we we got kind of results that we that we that we weren't really expecting from from all these studies, really. And what we what we tended to find was that the the drugs actually seem to reduce activity in in a lot of cortical regions. So we're expecting, you know, with we were going into this thinking, okay, you know, it's it's a sexual study, it's a it's a kind of fairly low level kind of limbic system y kind of response. Maybe we'll see some some increases in 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 those kind of regions. Actually, we didn't. What we saw was kind of the opposite, and it actually does make some kind of sense. So there's there's one, the main kind of theory about. Uh, hypoactive sexual desire disorder is that it's a it's a bit of a conflict between a a, a bottom up and a top down influence. So um, the bottom up uh, influence is the the normal kind of uh, sexual stimulus and sexual response cycle, if you like, and then the top down influence is thought to be kind of um, self-monitoring and and kind of a, a dysfunctional uh, kind of almost kind of like a dissociating from the experience like you you're kind of focusing on uh, the wrong aspects of the experience or focusing on too much too much self-monitoring you're, you're not able yeah. to kind of uh, relax into the experience if you like okay so what we what we tended to find was 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 reductions in activity with these drug treatments in these kind of cortical more self monitoring related areas so the in the cortical areas that you found i would have thought it would be just purely pre prefrontal uh in some regard but it looks like uh, uh you know i was looking at a diagram in your paper it looks like um you know secondary somatosensory cortex yeah um uh there are other yeah. Yeah, I mean, our interpretation of that is that the you know the secondary somatosensory cortex is a, a quite a kind of transmodal area, very integrative area. So obviously, it's it's taking information from somatosensory cortex, but it's it's integrating it with kind of social information. Okay, it's, you know, it's a really important area in uh, you know primates that do social grooming. Yeah, and things like that. And obviously, there's 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 a huge amount of social information involved in somatosensory functions. You know, hugging people, touching people. You know, the, there's there's all kinds of social cues involved in that. And then clearly, when when you come to the sexual functions, that's that's going to be an, an important area. So that that's our interpretation of of the findings in those areas. Yeah, and that it, makes sense. And that's interesting. That actually opens up my my mind as to what mm. FU is. I mean, that everyone, right? I mean, that's sort of an interesting idea of sort of integrating it with social aspects of. Mm. Um, yeah, that's cool. Cool. And in mm. the areas that increase, though, it seems that right. You have an increase in supplementary motor area, but S but S two is decreased uh, in secondary somatosensory cortex. Uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, um, but yeah, no, it's it's actually, and it's, it seems like it's very specific. It's a very it, it's there's not much visual, not much prefrontal. It's more like along the uh, the, the motor strip or the premotor. Yeah, 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 it's kind of mid, not midbrain, but like middle. Yeah, not 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 frontal, not not visual around those areas. Those 
not really the primary motor areas or the primary somatosensory areas, but these more integrative areas, which are which are which are integrating those basic functions with social, emotional, other kinds of uh, information. I think. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So, all right. Well, that's, that's actually kind of cool. That's, uh, um, and yeah, so that's, that seems like, and in, in, in general, right. I mean, that, that, this sort of work, you know, if you, if you start to know the drug effects and the hormonal effects in the body, then once again, the, the, the question comes up, is it a direct effect in the brain or is it sort of a indirect effect from the hormonal effect that's, you know, in the brain itself? Yeah. This is, this is the problem with sex, right? I mean, uh, it's, yeah. It's a stupid thing to say because we all know it's true, but sex is complicated, right? So, yeah, <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, as as neuroscientists, we're used to just thinking about how the brain works, and that's fine. But the sexual response, there's there's hormone systems, vascular systems, so many other. You know, it, it's really the the definition of a, of an embodied response. You know, which which can only happen. Um, with the cooperation of a lot of other systems, and yeah, I mean, you can imagine there must be f feedback feedback loops uh, in all of that stuff. Yeah. So, kind of doing these studies where you're just looking at the brain is is a bit of, a bit of a reductionist way of doing it, I think. Yeah, it's interesting, and one imagines if you, for instance, use TMS or or whatever and try to modulate these areas would you have some sort of effect or is it somehow mm. downstream that you wouldn't have an effect who knows mm. yeah um interesting mm. so that's very cool that's very cool and i think that uh yeah starting with these and also it, it does shed light on these areas to some degree i mean i think that uh uh using the known drug effects and and then seeing how they modulate the brain sort of mm. does tend to it's another avenue towards towards understanding these you know all the all the oh, yeah the i mean i'm i'm really excited about the kind of the next generation of of psychedelic research if you like going back to the the psilocybin things yeah because you know it's great these drugs have these these nice clinical effects and we can help patients and everything and that's great but these are these are fantastic tool compounds you know to to probe Con the nature of consciousness, you know, uh, the, the very biggest questions, you know, right. these incredibly powerful ways to influence consciousness, yeah, in various yeah. ways, and and that research, because of the legal situation with these drugs, it's incredibly difficult to even do these very clinically focused um, projects, you know, and you know nobody in a psychology department or you know cognitive neuroscience department is going to be able to do this stuff at the moment, but. You know, hopefully, if the legal situation relaxes a bit, uh, yeah. it might be possible to to start thinking about that kind of more basic science applications of these of these drugs as well. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Even with, uh, I mean, you can imagine if it's there's a true resetting mechanism. Yeah, I mean, it seems like right. I mean, also what people experience with psilocybin is sort of like you know an effect of a, a loss of a sense of self for a while, and uh, and that seems very subcortical you know trying to understand you know mm. what self-awareness is but it seems like also yeah it could have it could you can imagine applying this to uh, other types of psychosis as well and maybe um other than depression who knows it could reset other things <laughs> yeah i mean people have uh people have been pretty cautious about proposing yeah. using these things in psychosis because of the yeah at least the perception that there were a bunch of you know fried acid casualties from the from the sixties and so on that developed long term psychotic problems. But I mean, people are there. There has been a couple of kind of opinion pieces published where people have said, well, maybe we should look at using these in psychosis as well. Yeah. So just wrapping up this, uh, this is great. This is, I could keep on going talking about this, but uh, sort of looking towards the future. So. You know, some people might think, "Oh, the the brain imaging is in a crisis." I th actually think it's getting more interesting in this regard. I think that uh, we're getting our heads around variability. We're getting, mm. we're trying our best to apply it to various things like drug effects. So, what do you think, practically speaking, how how will the field progress? How can you imagine it uh, progressing, like in five or ten years? My best ideas are kind of related to things that we already talked about earlier so it's it's getting a handle on that that variability i don't know if this is practical or not but maybe 
developing techniques to 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 reduce that variability so i mean tasks where you you can really get people everybody all focuses in on does it in exactly the same way and and produces uh, you know a very standardized kind of response i don't know if that's possible or not right it's easy to say these things you know yeah it's yeah hard to come up with a new task which is going to be completely consistent across everybody yeah. so yeah understanding that variability which is which is you know a really uh, crucial question in in the kind of clinical studies that i do when we're looking at you know some patients have a good response and some people don't you know yeah. well, we want to understand that and it could be related to you know what dimension of the disorder they have i mean it seems like each dis disorder you can't just pool people like depressed versus not depressed. oh well like sure that's another yeah, that's another huge issue yeah yeah right. yeah um i mean but but maybe uh developing an understanding of, of how these people vary in terms of their brain measures might be actually be then be helpful in in delineating new kinds of diagnostic categories as well um yeah. which would be really i mean people have talk, been talking about you know brain-based diagnosis in psychiatry for a long time yeah and it's never really come along but you know maybe the time is now or yeah. at least soon um that would be nice i think for the for at least for the kind of work i do with drugs and, and patients it's really kind of bridging that gap between the molecular level and the the, the functional level. Yes. Uh, you know, psychedelics is a good example. Like we know they bind to the 5-HT2A receptor. We see that in PET studies. And we know we they produce these large scale effects on brain systems. We, we don't know what happens in the middle no. in, in between those two things, you know? Um, and that's, I think that's a, a vital question. That's going to need kind of multimodal studies where you're doing PET and, and MRI, maybe simultaneously. Um, and that, that, that just gives you a whole other level of difficulty and expense as well in, in terms of doing these studies because PET is very expensive and difficult. Um, but, you know, I think that's what's got to, that's what's got to happen. Um, yeah. if we really want an understanding of what's going on with these things. Yeah. Sort of right, having having more tools measuring. Um, uh, yeah, it, we didn't even really get into animal models other than looking at the molecular side of it. But it seems mm. that, you know, to the extent that you can, uh, you know, uh, do different types of, uh, you know, more invasive measures with, with animals. I mean, whatever, um, that might be an interesting avenue. But you're right, there is this gap between behavior, you know, global big you know, brain effects and, and molecular and with so many things. I mean, in, in the field of neuroscience, it seems mm -hmm. that, you know, it seems like there's almost like two camps where, you know, those studying single unit recordings and, and genetics and molecular aspects of things. But then, and then some people are studying circuitry, but it's only microcircuitry, but it's not like, the question is, is that right? The brain is organized across continuously across all these scales. Yeah. And, and we're getting at sort of, roughly a, a larger scale with fMRI, but there's more and we're realizing, oh, it's really, it's very complicated and variable, but yeah. you did. Yeah. Those and, you know, pushing the resolution and, and the, the techniques in fMRI is obviously going to be useful if you're talking about, you know, being able to see cortical columns and, and layers in the cortex. I mean, the, the, these are really important functional units as well. Maybe that can help to fill in that gap a little bit from the, from the top end. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, all these all these things are really important um, developments in in filling that gap as well. I think. Okay. Well, it seems like we we all have our work cut out for us, and and uh, and I definitely wish you the best in 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 what you're doing. It, I think that's a, it serves a really important area of of not only pushing the technique but pushing our understanding of of what these drug effects are. So so thanks for. Being on the being on the Neurosalience podcast. Oh, thank you so much. This has been really great. Uh, I'm honest, genuinely thrilled and honoured to be uh, be here and, and do this. Neurosalience is brought to you by Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This episode is produced by Omar Faruk Gülban and Alfie Werner.